Our guest on the program today, Jeanette Sadek Khan, wrote, uh, was one of several contributors to an article in Foreign Policy magazine that was published just a couple of days ago. I, I want to read from uh, her submission. She wrote, this challenge we're faced with isn't whether cities will survive as we know them. The question is whether we will have the imagination and vision to transform streets and, and bring about the safer, more accessible, more resilient cities we have needed all along. Jeanette Sadekhan is, uh, is with us now via Skype. Uh, Jeanette, thank you for, for joining us uh, with that, uh, the stage set, with that, that vision for the future. What are you thinking about New York post-pandemic? Well, it's, it's interesting. More than any other city in the United States, New York is really defined by its transportation system. It's, it's subways, it's yellow taxis, it's ferries. And it's interesting, it, it's never been really an either or proposition in New York. You know, we walk, we take the subways, we take buses, cars, as you pointed out, you know, the possibilities that you have with your car, you know, you never really saw before. But, but we take all of these transportation um, modes, sometimes all in the same day. And what's exciting is that New York City streets are empty of cars, but they're really full of possibilities that we really couldn't have dreamed of a couple of months ago. And we need this once in a lifetime chance to reclaim these empty lanes and reprogram them for a post COVID recovery. We can actually flip the script on our streets and give people real options to get around by transit, get around better by foot or by bike. And so what does an ideal street look like to you in New York City post-pandemic? Oh, here, here we are with the can of worms. We're going to go straight. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, a lot of people want things to return to normal, um, but we can do better than that. We can actually bring back our cities without bringing back all the traffic fatalities, all the congestion, all the pollution. You know, when you think about it, the status quo on New York City streets is broken. And so while the pandemic is challenging us, it gives us this once in a, in a century opportunity to give people more space to bike, to give more, more space to walk, more choices for, get around, for getting around. Because cities really have all the tools that they need to reset their streets and make sure that they're not just gonna recover, but they're gonna prosper. And that means making it easier to get around on protected bike lane networks on corridors throughout the, the city and to have a comprehensive strategy connecting a rapid bus network and subway and, and uh, sidewalk space that really puts people first. So I think it's important that we respond to the pandemic, but it's also critical for everyday New York. And this is the moment to make those changes. And you've been consulting with some other cities globally around their transportation infrastructure. I'm curious how New York compares to them and the problems and issues that they're facing. Are, are we in a better or worse off position? Well, I think it's exciting to see that cities are sharing what works and what doesn't. Certainly, we've done work in Milan and Bogota, and they've really given us a kind of master class on how streets built for people are built for long-term economic recovery. And that's exactly what we need now, and that's exactly what we need for the future. Because we shouldn't be making predictions for a city that we're scared of, like not going on transit. We need to be looking at what a safe future look, looks like and how to make it safe for people to get around uh, by transit and, and bike and by foot. I, I, I think there are like three absolutes in New York City. Good pizza, that the Knicks will tank, and that we have 24-hour subway service. And it's important that we keep people <laughs> safe, but we, we need to get the proper protocols in place as well. Okay, the Knicks have it. a chance. There's hope for them one day. <laughs> for the next, for the next, yeah, yeah, Pizza's yeah, we, always been good. The Knicks were once good, so we can hope on that front. Uh, and hopefully well, we I, get I back wanna, to 24-hour service. Yeah, yeah, hopefully soon. I, I, I want to dig into that idea of the, the economic argument behind rethinking the streets after a, a short break. We'll come back with some of your comments and questions and more of our interview with Jeanette Sadek Khan. When we continue. I'll fangirl out a little bit on our guest. I read her book. Jeanette Sadi Khan is our guest, by the way. I read her book, Street Fight, and it's so much about how opening up the streets is not about people losing car space or people gaining bike space. It's how 
everyone prospers, including all the local businesses, and how the whole city works better when everyone can get around better. On that, I want to bring you in, Jeanette, into the conversation. And can you give us a little bit more of your thought process about how better streets contribute to better businesses? Yeah, I think it's very exciting to see the administration following the city council's strong lead um, and following the footsteps actually of many cities um, by creating uh, car free and shared streets. And they've committed to the first 40 miles of what we hope will see be 100 uh, miles of car free streets. And I think it's really important to note that, you know, COVID is both a health crisis and, a, and, a, and an economic crisis. But for most New Yorkers, the immediate impact of the pandemic is being locked at home. And it's taking a huge toll on people's physical and mental health. So being able to get outside isn't just an amenity, it's actually a life necessity. And for all of us, you know, there's something eerie about empty streets. You know, New York with no people on its streets looks nothing like New York. It looks like something out of, you know, Will Smith and I Am Legend. You know, and, and it's, an, it's ironic, actually, because even as these empty streets taunt us, they also, you know, can keep us together during this stressful time. And, you know, some people say we shouldn't be encouraging people to go out, and, and that's fine, but we need to have a better option for the people who have to go out, whether to shop or work or, um, or to do the daily things that we need to get done. But New Yorkers can walk and social distance at the same time, and they know mm -hmm. how to do this. They know the language of open streets. They've been to weekend walks. They've been to summer streets. We've got 6,000 miles of streets. As Jamie noted, you know, we, they can sustain us beyond the recovery because better walking and biking and transit streets are better for business. But, but what's the economic argument there? Because I, I can tell you one of the most predictable things when a bike lane goes in, when a traffic modification goes in, is that the businesses that are along that stretch will find a, a, a New York One reporter or another local reporter and they'll say that my, my business is dried up because they took away the parking in front of, of my business. So, so you, you hear anecdotal evidence that's the, that's the opposite of what you're saying. Well, under uh, Mike Bloomberg's administration, we built 400 miles of on-street bike lanes and we put the first protected parking protected bike lane in the United States in. And what we saw along those corridors was that that was better for business. We saw retail sales for local businesses along those corridors increase. Uh, we found that the streets were much safer and much easier to navigate. And so what we found is that whether it was streets next to plazas and making it easier for people to walk in and out of stores, whether it was streets that had protected bike lanes, whether it was streets that had rapid bus lanes, all of those interventions made our streets better for the local businesses. And we measured it. One of the hallmarks of the Bloomberg administration was actually data collection. And so we looked at the data and we found these results. And that actually was a key piece of encouraging uh, people to, and, and getting the support of local businesses because they saw what it did to their bottom line. And it wasn't just anecdotes. Like in New York, you can reliably ask the yeah. cabbie what they think of an intervention. And, and the answer is, something I can't really repeat on, on New York One. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's interesting because as you were talking earlier, we were looking down over the pedestrian plaza at Times Square, which is there uh, thanks to the work that you did. Uh, there was a time that there were so many naysayers saying something like that is impossible to accomplish. Uh, we have to take a quick break, Janet. When we come back, we want to talk about what some of your ideas are that you think now seem impossible but could, in fact, help New York City's whole transportation infrastructure. Today, we are talking all things transportation and the city's infrastructure with Jeanette Sadek Khan, the former transportation commissioner of the city when Michael Bloomberg was mayor. And there was an interesting article that Jeanette wrote exactly three years ago in the Journal of the American Medical Association. I just want to show an opening quote here. It says, you write, our nation's most unheralded public health crisis isn't an exotic virus or malady transmitted from bugs nestled in our walls or mattresses. There aren't any viral ice bucket challenges to eliminate it. The way that our cities are designed is killing us, right down to the very streets that we walk, drive, work, and live on. Jeanette, how <laughs> ironic right now to look back at that yeah. quote. This is something that could have never really been imagined the way the city has ground to a halt. 
Well, it's it's true. With most of the vehicle traffic on, you can see actually how much space is committed to cars, which is really the least efficient way to get around, and and how useless that space is when we need it the most. And you can actually see the possibilities that are hidden in plain sight. And what we've seen is these, you know, the outlines for for what could be there, the outlines for the extended sidewalks that we lack, the bike lanes that we need, the transit lanes and, and public spaces that we need to build. I mean, they're really the outlines of the city that we need now and after the crisis. And so we talked a little bit before about how you're advising other cities internationally with their reopening and their reimagining of what their streets look like. What have you learned or what have you seen that you think we can and should be doing here in the city when things start to reopen? Well, I think it's exciting to see, you know, Denver, Oakland, Minneapolis and Tampa, they're all experimenting with car free or shared streets where people can walk and exercise and, and keep their sanity while keeping their distance. And that's all possible. New Yorkers can walk and, and socially distance at the same time. And they know how to do this. And, and so we're, we're seeing this all across this country. We're seeing this all across the world where cities and mayors are actually looking at this one moment in time like we've never had before to say, what is the future that we really want to come back to? We can actually reset our cities from the street up. Let's take this moment. And I think it's important that, you know, as thousands of stores and, and workplaces have closed and our streets have gone silent, you know, we've seen in New York that the city that never sleeps is actually staying in. I mean, New Yorkers are Zooming and, and Skyping and, you know, upping their TikTok game. Um, but when New York doesn't work, it doesn't move. And what we've seen is, you know, transit ridership is down some 90 percent. Traffic is down 60 yeah. percent. Um, but if you look closer, our streets are are not silent. You know, there are thousands of New Yorkers that have to get around that, that can't video conference into their work. And so a lot of essential workers uh, are helping the rest of us stay home, working in hospitals and grocery stores. And a lot of the essential workers take public transit, 55% um, according to the controller, and 10% walk or bike. So sometimes the heroes uh, ride a bus or sometimes they drive one. But we've got all of this opportunity that's literally hidden in plain sight um, that we can look to now to paint the city that yeah. we want to see.